Are they boned though? This is Tall Can Audio. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome inside an all-new episode of the Tall Can Audio Podcast. Give us a follow on social media, at Tall Can Audio. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you're hearing us right now. Bit of a bonus episode this week, because we've got some news around the Sens and everything going on. Uh, Steve Steos being announced as president today. Uh, Shane Pinto still not under contract. Uh, our buddy Graham Nichols is here. How's it going, man? Going well, Matt. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing all right. Glad you're back. And, uh, you know, we ended up having a little news to talk about today. We were already going to sit down and do the uh, the annual Sens preview show, but we figured we're here anyway, and there's a little news. We might as well get into it. Uh, how are things? What's happening? What's new? Uh, not too much. No? I have both kids in daycare, so I'm starting to get a little bit more free time. Freed you up a little? Some- you know, I can <laughs> selfishly get stuff done around the house that I need to get done. And right. Yeah, life is fine. A little time to do some podcasting. Yeah, I can <laughs> jump out for a podcast from time to time. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been really good lately, and yeah, can't complain. Nice. Hockey started, and right back in. That's it. It. So. it it it's barely recognizable rosters, but there is hockey, so you kind of get your fix as uh, as we inch towards the season here. Uh, we'll start with the pints, man. What'd you go with today? Uh, so I ran out of beer at home recently, so I just <laughs> popped in a bigger, got on the way to your place, yeah. and I uh, wound up getting Big Rig's Dropkick Irish Stout, 4.6%. See, I'm not. I haven't seen that before. I'm not sure if it's new or. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, it's, I've it's, seen uh, most of Big Rig's Dry stuff. Irish Stout, which I prefer. Yeah. Uh, hints of cold coffee. Classic pint worthy of celebration. So we'll see. Right on. Usually, I find their dr- big rig stuff is very safe. Yes, nothing, oh, it's always uh, pretty good. Nothing too outlandish. No, so we'll see. Uh, uh, this is from uh, the one I grabbed is uh, is Lake of Bays. Our friend Angelo from Lake of Bays was in here not too long ago with a couple new seasonals to tell us about. This is not one of the new ones. This is one that's been in the fridge here since uh, since her last visit. Maybe it's called Off the Grid, uh, a pale ale that uh, comes in around four point seven percent. It's it's early in the day, right? So we'll we'll take her easy here easy to start to with. It. Yeah, exactly. Uh, how's the, uh, the first pull on the Irish stout there? Uh, it's okay. Yeah. It's inoffensive. Inoffensive. <laughs> I know I like this one already. I had a couple when she brought them in. So, uh, <laughs> uh, kind of citrusy, not too bad at all. A little, uh, know, a little mango maybe. Pretty good. As I mentioned off the top, you're usually good enough to come on here and, uh, and do our sense preview show each, uh. Uh, each before the season starts. And so that was sort of what was supposed to happen today, and, and it will. Uh, but it was going to be saved for a week or so. I guess it's just about two weeks until uh, till the season starts. I was going to save it for then. But we actually woke up today to some Sens news, and that is that uh, that the uh, the Senators have hired as uh, president of hockey operations Steve Steos in perhaps the least shocking piece of news that uh, we'd always heard that this guy's name uh, was out there. Are you at all surprised it happened this fast or... Was it always pretty much once Ann Lauer had the keys, he was going to start bringing in his people? Yeah, I think well, we've already seen with their new director of hockey analytics, uh, Sean Tierney. I think one of the things that's obvious right from the get-go is Ann Lauer is comfortable bringing in the people that he's familiar with and who he's had success with before. At the, at, albeit it's at a junior hockey level, but mm-hmm. um, Stavos has been a, a name that's kind of uh, been circling the Senators' rumor mill for months, it seems, like at least a month or two. And... So it's no real surprise to see him come in. Um, there have been rumors about maybe seeing like Matthew Darsh come in as a prospect general manager candidate if if Dorian wasn't going to stick around. But yeah, uh, the press conference is supposed to happen in about forty minutes, so we'll see what the actual outline is. Uh, but I believe Dorian is supposed to be in attendance and will be on the uh, uh, he'll be on the panel, I guess. Uh, up on open, the dais, open, yeah, up on the dais, so <laughs> available for comment. So. Um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, for the first time in a long time, I think Pierre Dorian now has people that he is uh, responsible to uh, and has to answer questions to. So um, he's never really had that kind of, I don't know, controls, I, I would say, around him. Right. Uh, he's always had autonomy. We just report to Eugene Melnick or the board of directors uh, after Eugene Melnick's passing. So uh, to have a boss for the first time is uh, <laughs> who's not the owner. Right. Uh, is, is a huge, huge development for the organization. He's never, I, I, you know, I, I said this at the time when they hired Pierre Maguire to be uh, one of the assistant general managers, but I think, I don't think there's ever been this much of a direct threat to Pierre Dorian's job as there is now. 
Well, and and some of that maybe we may get into here in a minute. He's he's sort of put himself in some jeopardy here, trying to work out of a salary cap issue, and, and we'll see whether he's going to be able to get out of that. But maybe before we move off the management structure, am I correct in saying that because they also brought back in Cyril Leader, and he'll be president of business ops? Like, is that sort of going to be the way this pre- Steos will oversee the entire hockey department, but Cyril Leader will be more of the, the, business, the business side, side. of things? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's great to see Cyril in. Um, you know, uh, he probably never should have left the organization to begin with, but, um, you know, he was a casualty of the Eugene Melnick uh, era, right? Right towards How, the end. When did he, do you remember roughly when he left? Oh, man, I'd probably say it's probably been at least, what, three, four years? Yeah. At least. Yeah. Uh, I guess principally since uh, since Ottawa actually won the preferred bid status of Labret, and I think he's been gone, right? He was turfed shortly thereafter, and hmm. then... Uh, yeah, it's like great. Thanks for thanks for getting us that status. And here's the door. <laughs> right. So yeah, it, it's 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 exciting. It's encouraging. He's a familiar face and a familiar voice. And I think uh, many of the employees who are still with the or- with the organization um, under him are, are thrilled that he's back. Yeah, it seems very popular. Like this was one of those things that Sens fans seemed to want, right? And rarely do fans care as much about the guy overseeing like the the sales department and the business and stuff, but. Is it just like sort of a hankering back to or thinking back to better days or? I think, yeah, exactly. It's a cultural shift, right? I think, you know, you look at some of the articles that have come out uh, over the last year or two, especially the one that was featured in The Athletic, right? About Mm -hmm. Eugene Melnick's legacy with the organization, some of the turmoil that was happening behind the scenes there. And I think you bring in um, uh, someone who people attribute good good fun days with and Sierra Leader and I think that's just a step in the right direction and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Steos and everything else on the hockey side I think there are obviously still remnants of the Melnick era in hockey ops and mm-hmm. that, um, we're seeing the department grow and a lot of those names that have been hired in recent weeks are, are Ann Lauer's guys principally first and foremost so um, it's going to be interesting to see how the dynamic shifts there and what kind of changes we can expect down the road so you know as you and I were sort of talking before we fired up the show and, and you know the Steos thing had been out there for quite a while, right? That if Ann Lauer won the bid, Steos was a name he was probably going to bring in with him. Have you done much research? Have you talked to many people to see kind of what he's all about? And, and like, what do we know about Steve Steos and what he's likely to value here as he takes over the organization? Um, outside of being just a senior advisor to the Edmonton Oilers, obviously he was the general manager in Hamilton uh, when they won the Memorial Cup, right? Like yep. him and him and Ann Lauer have had success there. We mentioned that off the top. Um. He's had success everywhere he's gone. Uh, I don't know how big of a role he had in Edmonton. Like, I'm not privy to the, like the actual inner workings and the details of sure. what kind of work he did with the Oilers. But I mean, like, their organization has had success, and I know a lot of that can be attributed to their big cats. But you know, he's part of that front office, and he's trying to build a winner, or he was part of trying to build a winner around those guys here. And then that's that's kind of the task that's facing the Ottawa Center these days, right? You mm-hmm. have a good a good young core that you can build around. They're all signed for the next, well, it seems like the most of them are all signed for the next six to eight years, except for Shane Pinto, obviously. Right. Um, But we can get to that later. Sure. And, you know, he's kind of tasked with the same responsibility here. It's like, okay, we have to build and cultivate a winner. And how, how efficiently can we build uh, a good depth core around these young players? And I think that's kind of been the struggle. And I think we're starting to see that play out um, with the centers and the cap situation. Now it's just for the past few years, the organization's kind of struggled to identify good players to put around these young kids and build around them and have success building around them. And um, that's, that's, I think the biggest challenge right now, especially as we're trying to do cap gymnastics around Jane Pinto. So (laughs) it was a strange um, departure from Edmonton for Steve Steyo. So as recently as like a week ago, Ken Holland, their GM in, in Edmonton, was saying he's still part of our organization. He's away dealing with some personal stuff and that he hadn't spoken to him in like a month or something like that. And meanwhile, everyone was well aware that like nothing was guaranteed, but that there had been a lot of chatter around him leaving for Ottawa. So like it was interesting that Holland wouldn't even entertain that as a notion at the time. And then like you said, within a week, they're I making the announcement. Here. Never trust anything a hockey executive <laughs> tells you. I, I think that's the first step, right? I, like if you listen to like Dustin Nielsen or some of the Edmonton uh, radio guys, um, like going back like a month or two ago, they're like, oh, this guy's gone. Right. You know, like that's been, it's very well known. He wasn't on the, he wasn't on the Oilers website anymore. Like they pulled his profile and everything else. So it's like. Everything was kind of pointing in this direction. Sure. So why sit up there and say it then? Like, I, <laughs> it was a very weird moment anyway, I yeah. thought. I'm with you. I, I, that you don't trust. What's he going to say until something's formalized, I guess, right? I like, guess. there's also, you can't really say anything until a guy takes a job elsewhere anyway. True enough, right? I suppose. So yeah. 
I uh, mean, if you say like, well, he's no longer with us, then that kind of, you'll have people here whispering and talking right. about that, right? So it could put people in an awkward spot here as well. So maybe that's all he's trying to do. That's fair. Um, now, you mentioned the name a few minutes ago, Matthew Darsh, and uh, he's working, I believe, down in Tampa right now as an assistant GM. And typically the way that works, if you want to leave, is you can't leave to go lateral. You can leave for a promotion. So it's not like Michael and Lauer could hire him right now without Tampa's, you know, I, I guess Tampa could give you permission if this was really where Matthew Darsh wanted to go. Well, to Matthew Darsh be, was widely seen as a favorite for the Pittsburgh job before Kyle Dubas That's got right, it, right, yeah. So, or but if again, Kyle, but it would have been a, didn't want the job, then it was widely perceived or believed that. Uh, but that would have been a step up, right? Yes, for yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, from AGM to GM, and so this, if Andlauer wants to bring him here, in all likelihood, it, he has to be getting a promotion to general manager. And you mentioned a few minutes ago that maybe Pierre Dorian's job has never been under quite as much scrutiny or or threat as it is right now. Is is it your understanding? Like if. I can't imagine right now, barring something crazy happening, that like they're getting ready to fire Pierre Dorian in the next week or two. He's going to get a chance to start this season and whatever. But if they fire him, is it your assumption that it will be Matthew Darsh that would be brought in as the replacement? I well, same with Sean Simpson a few weeks ago. Like he reported the same thing. Like what he had been hearing was like Matthew Darsh would come in, Alfredson would come in, and, and some kind of front office role, whether it's player development or anything else. And Sierra Leader, it was Sierra Leader, Darsh, Steos, and Alfredson. Those are the four names I heard that would be joining mm-hmm. the organization in some capacity. Okay, um, but I mean. Whether that comes to fruition remains to be seen. Like yeah. you said, like Darsh is under contract with Tampa. He's their assistant general manager under Julian Brisebois. Um, and, you know, he, he's a guy who's been given a lot of pub and everything else, sort of like one of those executives who's not quite in that GM role, but who's had success at every level. Yeah. And he's someone who could be one of the next anointed ones, you could say. <laughs> um, so whether he comes or not, um, I don't know. It, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It, it, for an executive to leave one organization during the season, yeah, because we're you know like you said, less than two weeks away from the puck drop on October 11th <laughs> against the Hurricanes. Um, whether whether or not he comes in during the season is another matter. I think most teams want to get their front office um, in order uh, during the off season, and it's another thing once, once yeah, that's one thing when drops. It, coaches can get fired in season. It's rare when a GM gets dumped and a new one brought in mid season. Like that doesn't happen anywhere near as often. So no, so so we'll see. But I mean, like. It'll be interesting to see what's said at this press conference because, like, is Stios going to have an organizational review? Is he going to need a few weeks to review everything and then make decisions off that? Or has he already done that? Like, you don't really know yeah. until he actually comments on the matter and reflects on what he believes the front office should and should be or what, should, what it should develop into. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how comfortable he is moving forward with Dorian. So uh, we should talk briefly about Shane Pinto and uh, and the contract status. Um it's not done, no contract yet, no trade yet to make room. Are you surprised that it's it's dragged this long into camp? Because this is a, this is a young guy and it, Ottawa has to get off to a good start this year. They cannot stumble out of the blocks again. Um, I can't, I, I'm honestly, I'm very surprised that it's been allowed to drag on this long with this guy not in training camp getting ready. And I, I still believe he will be on opening night in the lineup and they will get it done. But it's not ideal that he's missing this much time. No, it's never ideal. And 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 in all honesty, you want you want that kind of like if this is the year where you're actually realistically expected to make a strong effort and push towards a postseason berth, you want to have everybody in camp. You want to have everybody playing games before the regular season starts. Um, and especially Josh, if we're already worried about Josh Norris. Well, Josh Norris is going to play. He's, he said he's going to try and get into a few exhibition yeah. games. Uh, he was practicing in non-contact. Uh, they had a three-on-three, a couple three-on-three scrimmages, I believe, today. So mm. I think he, by all reports, looked good and looked comfortable out there, was engaged. So um, he looks good. But, I mean, you want you want your third-line center and Shane Pinto to be there and playing. You want him to develop chemistry. I think if you look at Ottawa's depth last year, at the forward rank, like the third and fourth line contributions were lacking last year, and it was one of the uh, more obvious weaknesses on the roster. And you don't want to start the season uh, without your best lineup, uh, health permitting, obviously. Sure. 
And so, yeah, to not have him in the fold would be a massive blow, and I think it'd be a major shortcoming of of, of the off season. And it's it's weird because like you look at Ottawa's cap situation, they don't have a lot of bad contracts no. in the books, but at the same time. The organization has taken on a lot of salary with some one-year contract guys. Their big pickups in the offseason are one-year guys, essentially hired mercenaries for the year, and it's affecting their ability to re-sign one of their young players. Well, and that's it. Like, there's also $5 million in dead cap that's left yeah. over from other contracts. It isn't ideal. But as it's, you said, through the summer, it's it's Tarasenko, and it's even Hamannick, and it's like... If I'm Shane Pinto, I'm like, it's your fault we're here. Like, you could have got me done it's, first. It's, it, it is... A lot of what's going on right now is self-inflicted damage, right? right. Like, it is dead cap money. It's bad contracts to Michael Del Zato, Colin White. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, the Bobby Ryan buyout, you can argue. Because sure. I think, like, you maybe you let it run a year and then you buy him out or, or what have you. Um, but that's money that was going to be on the books regardless. But mm-hmm. Matt Murray, maybe they were hoping for Toronto buying him out so they'd actually get the salary relief really <laughs> there instead of going on the LTIR. Right. That's another conversation. <laughs> um, but y- you can't bank on Matt Murray getting bought – to be bought out, to be to like, save your hide. yeah, you can't like, that's totally out of your control. And, you know, I, I think what happened in Ottawa's situation, like my assumption would be, um, they traded Alex to at, they felt like Kubelik was an NHL ready piece who could come in and contribute and replace some of his offensive scoring. Mm-hmm. And I think they weren't anticipating Tarasenko circling back and saying, okay, I'll sign with you guys. This is what it'll cost. And I think Dorian just said, okay, well, he's, he's a talented player. We just, feel like we have to sign him and then we'll worry about the consequences after and I think what they're slowly realizing is it might be harder to trade a cap casualty than they were anticipating yeah. the one that they want like all rumors are that it's Matthew Joseph who's going to be headed at the door and at 2.9 million uh, it may seem like a lot of money because he didn't have a 5 on 5 goal last year but I mean you're talking about a 12 like the guy sh- on his career even with last season is a greater than 12% yep. shooter in this league. Oh, he's a perfectly usable player. Uh, right? Like he's, fine death player at 2.9 yeah. million. And, uh, you know, I think the problem is that Everyone knows like, like, your the Tarasenko, <laughs> like in signing Tarasenko, I think you can have a really realistic conversation and debate over whether that was the best use and uh, allocation of the team's cap space. And, you know, like I, I've beaten the drum online and analyzed – uh, would it have been better to sign Tarasenko or would it have better to have been to spread out that money and sign like a Thomas Tatar to a two-year deal? Right. Because he was looking for a multi-year deal that wasn't on the table in free agency. And he signed for pennies on the dollar in Colorado. And like Evan Rodriguez last year, that's a perfect landing spot where he can hopefully parlay that into a multi-year deal of his own next right. year. And, you know, the, like, and Pius Suter was a guy who signed in Vancouver for, for not a ton of money. And... You know, if you sign those two players for and, half the cost of what it, <laughs> if you sign those two players at half the cost of what it took to bring in Tarasenko, yep. you still have a lot of money left over to sign Shane Pinto and not have to trade anyone off the parent roster to make your team better. Uh, who do you or what do you expect that you know whether this is already done and they're just waiting to it can't find a trade partner? Like, what do you expect the number to be on a, a Shane Pinto contract? I, anything, anything over two to. 2.6 I'd say yeah. would be the ballpark for me like if you sign like a three year deal at 2.5 per right. uh, I wouldn't be surprised by that but um, we'll see I, I, like, I have no idea like Morgan Frost seems like an easy comp from Philadelphia I think he signed two year deal at like 2.1 or 2.2 uh, as well right. so I, like maybe that's a comp um, but I like I don't find it to be egregious but I think like it's it's too bad because I like I feel like this is such a short term problem for the organization just having the cap space to sign Shane Pinto it's like he's probably a guy that you would want on a four year deal at slightly higher money or five year deal at slightly higher money because he has a chance to outperform that contract mm-hmm. down the road but I, they might not be in a position this year to do it so a bridge might be the only alternative right now yeah it sure looks that way and and the rest of the league knows you're boned right now right like everybody is in training camp they lots of teams have their own PTOs here. Are they boned though? It's like there's eight teams in the league that have more than like $4 million in cap space. I don't mean that like you are screwed and can't possibly get out of it. I just mean those teams know, yeah, I'm going to ask you for a sweetener because you are stuck and I'm not, right? So it, sure. it, it's going to cost you to get me to help you. And, and that's fair. So yeah, I'm certainly not saying Ottawa's about to go off the rails and they're screwed and all that. It just means that 
there you have no leverage when you negotiate with these other teams. And so it's yeah. the worst time of year to be doing this as well because everybody's got their own guys in camp. They've sort of worked out their finances. People have brought in their own PTOs that they might be looking to sign. It's a tough time to get someone to suddenly just take $3 yeah. million dollars I, in. The only thing I'll say about that is that like – Everyone is assuming it's Matthew Joseph who yep. set it at that door. And obviously, at 2.9 million, 0 0.5 on five goals next year. I think he's a great candidate for regression to his norms. Sure. Uh, I think he's a guy who can give you good two way play. Um, you know, and I don't expect teams not to try and leverage the situation, try and get a sweetener. Yeah, because the, the teams time, with cap space aren't looking for good players. No, but at the same time, you can pivot and you can bring in it. You can offer a Kuba League. Sure. Or maybe you offer like a Branstrom and a forward to create some more, yep. some more flexibility there. Um, I think the only thing in saying that is the only leverage you lose in Ottawa's respect is like if you wind up trading a Kubelik or a Branster, maybe you're not getting as much as you could have at a later point in right. the season. You're just going to have to settle for whatever the highest draft pick is or whatever prospect it is or what have you, right? So I think that's the only leverage in the situation that would be unfortunate is that you could have a, a, a valuable piece mm -hmm. they have to move and you just might not get the return that you're hoping for so last thing for this one and like i said uh, for the good listener uh, graham will be back in about two weeks or a little less than that for uh, the season preview show but last one for this one anything stood out to you at camp uh, we're just a couple exhibition games in and they're also those very early exhibition games where you're not sure what kind of competition you're getting and, and you're seeing a lot of minor league guys, but is there anybody who's jumped out at you or you've been in, you know encouraged with what you've seen out of them early on? Uh, I wouldn't say any individual per se. Like It's great to see Anton Forsberg back and playing at a relatively strong level. Like it, like his first appearance, he looked solid. He like, looked like there were no negative ramifications mm -hmm. from his uh, two knee injuries that he suffered last year. Just um, brutal too. Double knee yeah. surgery. Yeah. But, you know, like uh, Shikran and Shabbat played, I believe it was like 25 minutes together against the Leafs on Sunday night. What do you think of that? Um, yeah, I wasn't anticipating that Shabbat would be on the right side, which I thought. Oh, was, I more uh, meant the minutes. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, like 25 minutes in a preseason game is a little bunch. Well, didn't but I mean, Shabbat like, get close to 30? They I thought. did. I yeah. think they're both close to 30. Yeah. Right? So it's Stop it's a it. lot. <laughs> but I think they're, it's hard because you're also in an evaluation mode and you want to kind of limit that. And I don't know. You need to keep Shikran healthy. Like that's the other part of it too, right? Yeah. Uh, and he's been prone to muscle pulls and everything else. So yeah, like giving them that many minutes off the hop is a little bit and concerning. I, but And if that's the pair, I like, I, I discussed this on an earlier pod. I liked that Shabbat was the one who moved because I think, and, and maybe you'll disagree with this. He's the one more likely to make kind of silly mistakes, even on his own side. He's more of an offensive guy than a defensive guy. And if those mistakes are going to happen anyway, then have him on his offside and let Chikrin be the stabilizer on the left side. And I know Chikrin did it in Arizona a bit um, with, to mixed results. Uh, I, I think I like Shabbat being the one who flips. I know a lot of us expected it would be Chikrin, but I, I think it makes more sense to have Shabbat on the right side. Yeah, I guess the argument works both ways, right? Sure. Devil's advocate can say the, the opposite. It's like if you have the weaker defenseman, you want him on his more comfortable side, so yeah. those mistakes get limited. So. I think it's just an evaluation period. I don't know if they're set on it one way or another, but I mean, this is the time of year where you explore and you experiment yep. uh, differences. I mean, like after one game, like they look totally competent, but again, it's, you know, it's the preseason. You're just judging them based off of what one and a half good lines that Toronto sure. put out. So um, I think the results from that game are encouraging. I think you got to just keep experimenting, keep looking at it, but um, you're not really going to be able to evaluate truly until you get to the later stages of the preseason yeah. when you start getting like those regular lineups in. And, you know, you like we we're joking off off air before the show, like you look at the lineup uh, that Winnipeg's uh, fielding like tonight <laughs> and it's it's just a mishmash of like Manitoba Moose, right? Well, like, same thing Toronto like, sending to Montreal, Pontus Holberg just, at one center. And there's, like, oof. There, there are too <laughs> many, there are too many exhibition games. Yeah. Like there are way too many exhibition games. Yeah. Um, I wish they were cut in half. I wish they played four and then you just have regular lineups, get the guys like comfortable playing with each other and go. Yeah. But uh, Stutzla looked pretty hot there in his first game on Sunday, two goals. He looks like he's ready to hit the ground running again, right out of the shoot. Yep. Yeah. He played, played as well as you can expect him to. And uh, yeah, I can't complain. Matthew Joseph had an excellent game the other night in Montreal. Um, showcase. Showcase game, <laughs> I guess you could say. <laughs> Um, it's so it's, it's encouraging. There's like, you're, you're hoping for a bounce back. You're hoping for a continuation of like great play. 
Stutzel was fantastic down the stretch last year. Uh, once the calendar turned 20, uh, 23. Right. Like he was on, I think, like a 105 point pace. Yeah, he sort of stumbled uh, a little out of the gate. And oh, then man. his second lights half out. was unreal. Just yeah. lights out. Yeah. I mean, obviously, when Josh Norris gets into a game, you're going to be looking to see how he responds and how his shoulder looks. And, you know, whether the Senators use him on face offs off the hop or whether they're going to kind of protect his shoulder a little bit. So, right. There's a bunch of good stuff to look forward to. Artem Zub and, and Sanderson being a pairing together. That's another thing that I want to look forward to uh, over the next like three, four preseason games. So there's a bunch of good stories. Uh, hopefully they get Pinto under wraps soon and then they can move this thing forward. Are you, um, just to circle back to that, maybe before we wrap up on Pinto, are you as confident as I am that he'll be in the opening night lineup or do you think there's a chance this drags? Uh, I think if he's not in the opening night lineup, uh, the front office Pierre Dorian of might not be. Either. You have a lot of <laughs> questions to answer. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Uh, we'll wind this one up here. We're gonna uh, we're gonna record a sense preview show with Graham here, so uh, that'll drop on. Uh, what is it? I guess the eleventh is opening night. Eleventh uh, Wednesday, the eleventh. Yeah, yeah, against uh, the Carolina Hurricanes. So um, Graham will be back uh, then. Uh, just a quick one today, though, because the the Steve Steos news is is interesting. It had been out there for a while, and and Ann Lauer didn't waste much time uh, once he got the keys, uh, getting that. To, well, I guess it's a week to the day from him actually being unveiled uh, before he starts bringing in his own guys. So interesting to see how that all pans out. Uh, we'll wrap this one up here for Graham Nichols. My name's Matt Robinson. We'll see you next time. The hell is that? Number one bullshit. Oh, number one bullshit. Why are you so pissy?